That's the sound of the deep ocean. It's what a man named Frank Watling heard in the 1960s when he was an engineer for the U.S. Navy. Now, Frank had a very specific job. All day long, he used a hydrophone, an underwater microphone, and listened to the ocean, waiting to hear a submarine. It was a cold war, tensions were high, and Frank took his job very seriously. For hours, he'd listen to the steady noise of the sea, waiting for the sound of a submarine engine, the turn of a propeller, or the ping of a sonar. Anything that would mean danger. And then, one day, Frank heard something that changed his life. Now, I'm sure you know that that's a whale song. But when Frank heard it, no one knew that whales could sing. He knew right away that this recording was special, but he wasn't sure how special. So he invited a couple of whale researchers to give it a listen. What we now know is that that recording was the sound of humpback whales singing. Listen, it's amazing. Now, how many whales do you think are singing right now, making all that noise? Just one whale. And I don't know about you, but to me, it's beautiful. And it certainly was for Frank, too. He was so moved by the sounds he heard that when that top U.S. Navy engineer gave his recording to the researchers, he told them, save the whales. That's what that recording meant to him. That's how impactful a single close encounter with a whale can be. You know, whales have fascinated us for centuries. We've told stories, painted art, written novels, all trying to answer a simple question. Who are these incredible giants that swim beneath the surface? Graceful, powerful, mysterious. And how can we protect them? Well, today we're going to introduce you to some of Alaska's iconic whales, and their incredible stories. And I hope by the end of our story, you'll not only have a better understanding of these gentle giants, but you'll gain a new appreciation for just how critical they are to the survival of our oceans, and in turn, us. Now, what we knew, and what I hope you will see, is that by learning about whales, we can begin to understand how to help whales. So, let's start with the basics. 17 species live or pass through Alaska, and they come to Hawaii. They attract more than half a million people who come to see or research Alaskan whales every year. And one of the most beloved whales in Alaska is the humpback whale. So the humpback whales are extremely popular with whale watchers. And that's largely because they're really big and they're easy to find. And they're really fun to watch. Humpback whales migrate up to 16,000 miles a year. That's like swimming from Alaska to Australia three times over. In the winter, they live and breed in the warm waters near Hawaii. But in the summer, something incredible happens. As the wintry water of Alaska begins to melt and warm up, it meets the steady winds of the North Pacific, forming a system that oceanographers call upwelling. The wind blows the warm water away, displacing it, which forces the cold water from the bottom of the ocean to rush upwards, bringing tons and tons of microscopic food with it. The food feeds the krill, which is what the humpbacks eat. Which means that humpbacks are currently making their way up north, actually following the same route that our Alaska cruises take. That's during the summertime. But in the wintertime, they're here in Hawaii. Now that means it's the perfect time for us to see them. Now, many of you may be familiar with some of the more flashy humpback behaviors. And this, by the way, is the humpback version of a peacock tail. In other words, he's showing off. There's another thing that humpbacks do which is a little harder to see and tells us much more about these amazing creatures. I'm going to let Craig Matkin explain. Craig's a research biologist based out of Alaska. And his focus is generally on killer whales, but he knows a thing or two about humpbacks. As killer whale biologists, we always make fun of humpbacks a little bit. They're so big and bulky, you know, and they do everything so slowly, and they just open their mouths and graze, you know, and it's like, well, it's not quite like that. 
bubble net feeding is one of those things that shows you just how complex humpback whales are because what it takes is a group of humpback whales to get together six, eight, or even more and learn how to work together to corral prey. One animal, usually there's a lead animal, goes down and starts blowing bubbles and making these calls. They're hard to listen to because they're so intense and they pull the fish into a ball too so they can bring this bubble tighter and tighter and then other whales will bubble and you get this whole net of bubbles plus these vocalizations go on and on as the whales work the fish up to the surface in the middle of this net that's formed by the bubbles making these calls that make the fish just want to you know, hug each other you know bubbles produce noise reflect light and disturb the water in other words bubbles confuse and trap the fish which makes it easier for the whales to go in and feed now the whales surround the fish singing louder and louder trapping them with a net of bubbles and then when everything is just right the leader makes a new call and all the whales come rocketing up from the depths mouths open just swallowing up all that fish that they corralled together in this bubble that feeding every animal has a position they're playing everybody is down there either bubbling or vocalizing and it's a it's a team effort it's a very well choreographed team effort in fact it's hard to imagine how they choreograph this thing the way they do and the interesting thing is in our area they didn't used to do this until about 10 years ago and suddenly we started seeing this bubble net type feeding where we were now this is really interesting they didn't used to do that in Craig's area, but now they do. So Craig got curious. He took some photos and sent them to his humpback researcher friends. And they said, yeah, we know some of those whales. Those are our bubble netters. They had come to Craig's part of Alaska and they taught the local population how to catch fish this way. Isn't that fascinating? You know, we tend to think of animals learning new behaviors slowly over many generations. Not by someone taking a trip and teaching some new buddies a cool trick. But here's the thing about humpbacks. The more that we learn about them, the less surprising the story is. Take, for example, their song. Every year in the fall, the Alaskan humpbacks start singing. They start this song in the fall on the Alaska feeding grounds, and then all during this winter period, they're changing it. Somebody comes up with a lick and everybody goes oh wow that's cool or the females go we like that one and then all of a sudden the other males go oh i'm gonna work that one in it's like a daisy chain it's wild they teach each other a song then they improvise on it they jam and then pretty soon all the humpbacks are singing the same song and by the way in the summer they stop singing but in the fall well they pick up exactly where they left off the same tune with the same variations, slowly evolving and changing until the next summer when it all starts again. And these are not simple melodies. They are sometimes 20 minutes long and they repeat them over and over. Whale songs are a complete mystery to us. We don't really know why they sing. Some people believe it's to woo females and others think it's a tonal map like if a whale learns the way locals sing in each part of the ocean, then they can figure out where he is in the planet. Hmm. Or maybe they're just singing for the same reason any of us sing. To look cool, have fun, pass the time. Now, remember the researcher who heard that first recording I told you about? Her name is Katie Payne. She and her then husband studied whales and other animals. And here's what Katie said about that first recording to National Public Radio in 2015. We had no idea we were going to hear anything. He said, I don't suppose you've ever heard the sounds of these animals make. And then he played the song of the humpback whale. I had never heard anything like it. Oh. Tears flowed from our cheeks. You know, we were just completely transfixed and amazed because the sounds are so beautiful, 
so powerful, so variable. Katie had a degree in music as well as biology, so she turned to her music education for some insight as to what she was hearing. She searched for patterns in the whale recordings using a tool called a spectrogram. She found what looked like melodies and rhythms, pieces that repeated over and over again, phrases of music. It wasn't just random noise. And when she compared it to other forms of music on the spectrogram, it looked a bit like jazz. Mm. Well, I know what you're thinking. Sounds ridiculous. That's what many of her peers in the scientific community thought as well. Whales aren't singing. Animals don't talk. They just make noise, right? But the scientific community came around quickly. Katie was right. And her findings have become a fundamental part of how we think about these creatures. In fact, the discovery of humpback whales singing was so exciting that it became part of pop culture. That's a record of whale songs that Katie's former husband released in the 70s. It was so popular that it made it to the Billboard Top 200. Can you imagine? You go to the record store, you pick up Led Zeppelin, The Who, Whale songs, ABBA, that's the 70s for you. But even more amazing than that, humpback whale songs have gone where no one has ever gone before. Seriously. Somewhere out there is a NASA probe called the Voyager. And on board, there's a golden record containing the sounds of life on Earth in case an alien intelligence ever finds a probe and also has a stereo system. The Golden Record contains greetings in 55 different languages, from ancient ones to modern Chinese. And it contains a whale song. The Voyager probe just left our solar system and is now 13 billion miles away from the sun. Now, think about that for a second. If an alien intelligence is out there in the cosmos and finds the Voyager, they're going to hear songs of a species that we here on Earth are still trying to understand. Now, of all Alaska whales, the orca or killer whale is one of the most striking and recognizable. They are black with uh, distinctive white spots and they weigh up to six tons and span 23 to 32 feet. Now, whether you call them killer whales or prefer their Latin name, Orsinus orca, orca for short, you can't deny how magnetic they seem to be. I didn't really intend to do killer whale work. I intended to go to Alaska and I worked as a fisheries biologist, which is what I started doing. The whales found me, you know. I was in a kayak in a lagoon in Prince William Sound where killer whales just don't go. And I had killer whales come charging in and I couldn't believe it. They all just came right around the kayak and started just swimming really slowly and just hanging around in the water and where I could be eye to eye with them. And it went on for maybe a couple hours. I didn't know what the, was going on at the time. It's what I call now group resting. They just rested and hung out with me there for two hours or so. It was amazing. And, you know, I wasn't really afraid. I just was completely consumed by them. I wasn't thinking about everything that was going on. It was just something that pulled me right into being there with them. And so it changed everything. Orcas are found all over the world, but there are actually two different types of killer whales, residents and transients. They look almost identical. The males of both types have a triangular dorsal fin, and the females have a curved sickle-shaped fin, which, by the way, you can see while whale watching. But despite the similarities between the transient whales and the resident whales, they're very different. They've been separate for thousands of years, perhaps 10,000 years or more, and they just act like different species. But they look the same to the untrained eye. Well, the transients are stockier and um, have more point, pointy fins, and they dive in a different manner, you know, they do longer dives usually. They're very stealthy. They don't talk much. There's a good reason for this. The transients and residents eat different things. The residents eat fish, and the transients eat marine mammals like seals, sea lions, and porpoises. 
So they hunt in very different ways. The residents are very noisy. Fish aren't bothered by the noise. They're spread out, all using echolocation, you know, bouncing sound out to locate fish um, and communicating with each other about what they're seeing here, what they're seeing there. And then they get in close and you hear the echolocation changes. It gets very um, quick and high pitched. And then it stops, and that's usually where they're using eyesight now to chase a fish. The transients have to be really quiet. They have to use stealth. If transients echolocated on seals, seals gone. But the fish don't respond to this. Transients um, tend to travel these long distances up to 1,500 miles. Residents travel shorter distances, maybe 300 to 600 miles. But that's still, they don't sit in one place. None of them sit in one place. But residents do tend to be concentrated along the shoreline a few hundred or more miles long. And transients will cover a whole ocean base. But they do come back to the same places again and again. They have hot spots that they prefer that they come back to. So let's talk about how scientists organize these whales. First comes the community. There's southern resident, northern resident, and then the transients. And each community is broken into pods, you know, groups of whales that tend to live and hunt near each other. The pods are given letter names based on the order in which they were discovered. Now in Alaska, they are practiced with the letter A for Alaska. The northern residents are generally known as A pod, A, B pod, and so on. And within the southern resident population, they are known as the J, K, and L pod. Now the transients, because of how vast their territory is, are given a series of different name prefixes. Generally, they're given T for transient, as in T1, T2, etc. Now, in Alaska, some researchers add an AT for Alaskan transients. It's all a bit confusing, but for this story, you just need to know about the AT1 transients and the JK and L pods of southern residents. And the pod isn't even a small category. It's also important to note that killer whales are matrilineal. They follow the mother's line. And scientists have observed that mature orca stay with their mothers long after they bred and grown up. Oh, the family bonds with these animals are just as tight as ours. The um, offspring with resident fishing in killer whales stay with the mother forever. The males wander off in their other pods around to mate with those females. They're back to mom, and in the end, they're with mom. And mom's feeding them even when they're big adults. Anyone else have a cousin like that? <laughs> Anyway, these different populations not only have different behaviors, but they have very different issues they're facing. Now, remember the transients, the ones that eat marine mammals? There was a huge push to protect the harbor seal, which is their main food source. And as a result, they're doing well for the most part. The transients in our area, there are two populations. One, we call the Gulf of Alaska transients, they're stable. And then we have this AT1 or Chugach transients, which my wife specialized in working on, and they're going extinct. They lost a bunch of animals after the oil spill. And it's a unique population. It's not just a pod. It's unique genetically, acoustically. There's nothing like these whales. Nothing like these whales. And there are only seven of them left, and they will probably um, blip out in the next decade or two. We don't know all the reasons. The oil spill was the nail in the coffin, but there were problems before that. The harbor seals had declined dramatically. We don't know all the reasons that they're <coughs> extinct, but there was the oil spill nail in the coffin thing. The Exxon Valdez spilled 10.8 <coughs> million gallons of oil more than 30 years ago, and the orca are still feeling the impact. On the other hand, the fish-eating northern residents are doing great. They live mostly around northern Vancouver Island in southeast Alaska, where the water is clean. There's abundant fish for them to eat, and their population has been increasing for the past 40 years. If you go just a few miles south, the southern residents live primarily in the waters off British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon. They share the water with more than 6 million people who live nearby. Down there, they've been declining certainly over the last 10 years dramatically, 
and their body condition has been going down, and only 76, I believe, of, of them left. It's a serious problem. They could be headed for extinction. Many scientists think they are. In the late 1990s, there were nearly 100 southern residents. Today, there are only 75. As far as anyone can tell, the main issue is food. The southern residents eat mostly Chinook salmon, and the Chinook are no longer plentiful because of increased damming and loss of habitat. They're starving to death, you know, and um, the pregnancy rate, they're seeing pregnancies and then the calves don't show up. They're aborting or they're dying really early. Well, there was a, a, a calf that died not long after birth, not too long after birth. This southern resident, this endangered female killer whale uh, in Puget Sound, pushed around this dead youngster for 17 days over a thousand miles. Now you may remember the headlines several years ago. At the time, the baby girl was the first known calf to be born to the southern residents since 2015. She died less than an hour after she was born. The mother grieved and grieved. She carried the 400 pound calf 60 to 70 miles a day. It was a devastating display of grief. Researchers were heartbroken by it, and so was much of the world. Other animals come in when there's a dead calf, and they may spend hours and hours, all of them together, just push, actually pushing the calf around, giving each a chance to be in touch with it, and um, you know, and, and obviously involved in what appears to be the mourning process. Only the killer whales know why it was such an extreme grieving experience. But you know, everyone's grieving experience is different. You can't explain grieving in humans. They used to put it in boxes. I've been there and you can't explain it. And it comes and goes, but it's an incredibly strong force. And guess what? They feel it too. My wife died a couple of years ago and she and I were partnered for 31 years. And you know, after the first two years of being so pissed off she wasn't out there with me, after a while you realize these guys are like family, you know? My being out here, being with these animals and keeping it going, it keeps her going. These animals are feeling the same things we are, and it's not just about grieving calves. And we should understand that what we do has an effect on what their lives will be. What we do has an impact, and I just want to put that in the room, think about that for a moment. If the phytoplankton disappear, then the krill have nothing to eat. If the krill have nothing to eat, then the Chinook starve. And the orcas need to eat 30 Chinook salmon a day to survive. It's all connected. Take, for example, the blob, a massive warm water in the Pacific that's empty of nutrients. Remember that upwelling that we talked about? If that process stops, there's no food for anything. What happened during the blob is ocean circulation stopped, temperatures went up, this high pressure area wouldn't go away, and basically Gulf of Alaska became stagnant. If we start having conditions like that repeatedly, the salmon are going to suffer because the feed fish suffer immediately, and salmon have to have these feed fish. So do seals for the transient killer whales. So there's going to be these long term effects with these whales. And that's the scariest thing. This was sort of a perfect storm situation, but we can have variations of this um, in the future, and it wouldn't surprise me. This is something nobody had ever seen before. These are temperatures degrees above what had ever been recorded over the last, you know, 50, 75 years. And we all know that there's anthropogenic reasons for this happening. Um, all the pathways are not clear, but it's clear the temperatures are going up and weather is becoming much more erratic. So that's a very frightening aspect of the future. By watching killer whales and their health, you can see the overall trends in the health of the waters. But whales aren't just canaries in the coal mine. The function of a predator, in part, is to maintain the health of its prey, as much as that sounds um, a little counterintuitive, but if they aren't putting pressure on the prey, 
to, to stay at the top of their game, to um, you know, really select for those that are going to be most beneficial to the changes that are going on in the world, then they aren't serving their purpose in the sense in the ecosystem. This is the role that predators have, and it's an important one. So in that sense, they also maintain the health of the ecosystem. And new threats to the orca population continue to surface all the time. So that's a lot of bad news. It's not great. But there are reasons to be hopeful. People are fighting against the pollution of the Northwest waters, and we're taking care of the salmon population that feeds the killer whales. Salmon's important to all of us, you know, and, and fishing regulations, as hard as they are to want to impose on people, that's happening, and it's a tough thing to have happen. And whether it's too little, too late for there, we don't know. But in Alaska, we're going to make darn sure it's not too late. So far, the regulations and protections are working. In January 2019, a new calf was born to the southern residents. Around 40% of calves don't survive the first few years, but the baby orca appears to be healthy so far. And we can always learn from the amazing recovery of humpbacks. In 2020, Talipwa, the whale that lost her calf, gave birth to another baby who's doing well. Humpbacks were hunted to near extinction. Some populations were reduced by more than 95%, but now they're flourishing. On average, 50% of female humpbacks are pregnant in any given year. And for better or worse, the warming of the Arctic waters has temporarily increased the humpback's food supply, krill. Now, remember what we said about bubble net feeding, how it was a group of whales working together in a variety of ways to accomplish a single task. Well, in many ways, the recovery of the humpback population takes a cue from the collaboration demonstrated by the species during feeding. In this bubble net feeding, every animal has a position they're playing. Well, it's a very well choreographed team effort. And similarly, there's been a global effort from private citizens, nonprofits, federal government, and the general public to work together to protect the humpback. And to close out today's talk, I'd like to share a particular story about a time when a group of people did something amazing for these majestic creatures. It all started on October 7th, 1988. And a new hunter, Roy Amagat, discovered three gray whales trapped in ice near Point Barrow, Alaska. Whales, like us, breathe air. And the whales were unable to leave the little hole they had without drowning. Roy tried to cut the ice to create a path for the whales to reach open water, but it didn't work. Local villagers stepped in to help. A company heard about the whales and sent some extra chainsaws. And the volunteers worked through the night using the chainsaws to cut holes in the ice for the whales to breathe. In fact, word got out and soon the media was paying attention. The whales were given Inuit names, Hutu, Siku, and Kanak, and English names, Bonnet, Crossbeak, and Bum. Everyone was excited to see them reach safety. And as more and more people chipped in to help, it looked like the whales would make it. But a new problem surfaced. An ice ridge had built up against the shore, and it was much too thick for a chainsaw. The whales were stuck. By then, Bonnet, Crossbeak, and Bone had some fans in very high places, including the U.S. government, who turned to the Russians. And despite the Cold War, the Russians realized whales... Now, we don't know what ultimately happened to those whales. Scientists didn't want to tag them and cause them more stress. What it is clear is that people loved those whales, and that love produced an incredible amount of cooperation. Inuvia hunters, biologists, oil companies, the Alaska National Guard, Greenpeace, the U.S. Department of State, the USSR, and more. An unlikely group worked together to free those three whales. And for me, that means hope is alive. Well, today there are countless ways to help. 
There are dozens of organizations across the United States that are counting, tracking, researching, and advocating for the whales. You can even download an app on your phone that will teach you how to identify an orca while you're whale watching and will help researchers track the movements of these creatures. Each of us can make a difference in our own way. We can put aside cultural differences, political conflicts, and competing interests. We can change our perceptions and behaviors. We can come together to care for our planet and for the mysterious and beautiful creatures of the deep. Thank you for joining me today. Aloha.